Welcome to the Low Carb Conferences podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Gerber, and our special guest today is Dr. Chris Palmer, and he'll be speaking at our event in uh, February 2023. So how are you today, Chris? I'm doing great. Thank you. Hey, it's great to have you aboard. So Dr. Palmer is a Harvard Medical School physician and psychiatrist, a professor, a well-published researcher, clinician, educator, and has served in many leadership roles. He's also an author with his new book, Brain Energy, that's coming out this fall. He's affiliated with McLean Hospital, Massachusetts General Hospital, and Harvard Medical School. So Chris, if you can give us a little more background, tell us about your professional interests and how you became interested in using nutrition as a tool to address mental illness. Sure. Um, so, you know, so I'm at one of the largest psychiatric hospitals in the Harvard Medical School system. And, you know, my, yeah, yeah, for a little over 20 years now, I've been the director of continuing education here. So on, on one hand, I am in a very kind of highly esteemed slash conservative mental health organization and, um, and represent kind of the state of the art in the mental health field. Um, I've, you know, for over 15 years, I did neuroscience research in the fields of addiction and sleep. Uh, and, you know, through all of that, I've always maintained a clinical practice. Uh, um, I've always in typically my clinical practice com is composed of treatment resistant patients. Um, so people who have been to lots of other mental health professionals, psychiatrists in and out of hospitals, usually have tried lots of medications and, you know, years or decades of psychotherapy, nothing's working for them. And then they come to me um, and, uh, and then I'm supposed to try to do something for them. So that's my kind of day job. And then, you know, the way that I came into using nutrition, really the, the quick story is that it starts with my own journey, like over 20 years ago, I was, you know, religiously following a low fat diet, exercising regularly. And already in my twenties, I had metabolic syndrome. Um, I decided to try a low carb ketogenic diet at that time called the Atkins diet. And uh, lo and behold, it uh, reversed my metabolic syndrome. But the thing that I noticed was that it also resulted in profound effects in mood, concentration, energy, um, and sleep. Uh, my sleep was much better. And these were dramatic changes for me. And I, I had never really felt that way in my entire, entire life. And so I started recommending the diet to friends and family. Many of them were noticing similar improvements and so within a couple of years, I started using it in patients with treatment-resistant depression. And lo and behold, it was working for at least some of them. And But for the most part, because you know the Atkins diet at that point was so highly controversial, we didn't have as much research published in the medical literature at that point. Uh, I really kind of stayed quiet about it. I, I, I wasn't really talking about it, wasn't publishing anything about it. Um, just trying to help the patients in front of me. And, you know, my career in many ways took a dramatic turn in 2016 when I, you know, one of my patients uh, for over eight years with schizoaffective disorder asked for my help to lose weight. And, uh, you know, even though I'd been using ketogenic diets for depression, depression and schizophrenia are very different disorders. So I had no, um, I had no hope or no expectation that this was really going to do anything for his psychiatric symptoms. I was simply trying to help him lose weight. And within two weeks, not only did he begin losing weight, but I noticed dramatic changes in his level of depression and alertness. He was making better eye contact, talking more. And I thought, well, isn't that interesting? Here's that antidepressant effect that I've seen in other people. And wow, it's kind of doing the same thing for him. But at that point, he was still having hallucinations and delusions. Um, the, the shocking thing to me was that about six to eight weeks into it, 
he spontaneously started reporting that his hallucinations were going away and that his long-standing paranoid delusions were also going away. He began to realize that they weren't true and probably never had been. And, you know, initially I was dumbfounded. I really was. I had no expectation that it would do anything. And this, this went against everything that I knew about schizophrenia. Schizophrenia doesn't go into remission. It does not get that dramatically better with any of the best treatments that we have to offer. Clozapine, other antipsychotics, even shock treatments. I've seen dozens and dozens of patients get all of those treatments, and I've never seen such dramatic improvement in symptoms. And so I went on a kind of scientific search to try to understand what am I seeing? Like, how can I understand this? And although I knew about the ketogenic diet as a weight loss intervention and its use in type 2 diabetes, at that point in time, I didn't know that it was used as an epilepsy treatment and that it was actually an evidence-based 100-year-old epilepsy treatment. And that was particularly relevant to me as a psychiatrist because we use epilepsy treatments in psychiatry all the time in millions of people. You know, medications like Depakote, Tegretol, Lamictal, Valium, Clonopin, Xanax, Neurontin, all of those are epilepsy treatments. But in fact, most people who've heard of those names know them as the, from their use in mental health patients, not in epilepsy patients, because mental health conditions are much, much more common than epilepsy is. And with that, I ended up you know, doing a deeper dive into the neuroscience, like do they actually understand how this diet stops seizures? And in fact, we do. We've got a lot of basic neuroscience research documenting the effects of this diet on the brain, neurotransmitter systems, brain inflammation, all sorts of things. And many of those mechanisms of action are known to be relevant to patients with serious mental illness. <clears throat> Over, you know, I didn't stop there. So I you know, that started me on a path to using this in dozens of patients. I've been collaborating with researchers and clinicians from around the world. Clinical trials are underway now. Um, we have, uh, you know, a very generous family, the Bazuki family, that is funding lots of research in this area. So things have really taken off, but <clears throat> I didn't stop there. Because again, this flies in the face of everything I've been taught as a psychiatrist. Schizophrenia. Well, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, man, that was packed, loaded with all kinds of information, Chris. <laughs> Sorry. I love it. So first I have to commend you um, in terms of bringing this into your, your, your clinical practice and uh, dealing uh, with patients in this way, especially, you know, working at the university and, um, I think they've already recognized what, what you do and, and they um, acknowledge that uh, you're approaching uh, these conditions with uh, uh, dietary treatment. Yes. That, so that's one of, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people in the low carb and keto community do not like Harvard. Um, they hear about the Harvard School of Public Health and how the how the researchers there shun the ketogenic diet and low carb diets. Um, but I just want to say for the record, Harvard is a really big place, and there are thousands and thousands of clinicians and researchers there with a broad range of opinions on nutrition and other matters. So. Um, the, my hospital has been extraordinarily supportive of these efforts, and um, so it's been great. Yeah, so the idea is that Harvard, we, we look at them as the medical authority, but, um, you know, the, the idea is that, as you said, there's all, all kinds of different uh, thought processes going on, and, and, you know, the hope is that there's, there's people like you that are kind of open to new ideas and thinking outside the box, and to your credit, um, it's just, it's fantastic. And, you know, it's kind of frustrating, uh, that we as healthcare professionals had to learn about nutrition through our own personal experiences. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's the same experience, uh, for me, I, I had gone through this learning process and, and then started applying this to, uh, 
to the patients. Now, um, you know, your, your fantastic uh, uh, experience back in 2016 with, with the one patient, you know, you, you call that a case study. And then you, you know, you now apply it to your patient population and, and you have case after case after case where you show that there's an improvement or benefit. Some might even say, well, they're anecdotes, but, you know, we have healthcare professionals uh, watching over. So perhaps they're, they're case studies. And so the next step, of course, is to turn this into academic research and, you know, you mentioned that you have a philanthropy that that's helping you with that. And, um, you know, I'd like to ask more about, you know, what is in the future in terms of uh, researching uh, the use of ketogenic diets and mental health? So this is a burgeoning new area in the mental health field. People are extraordinarily excited about it. Um, so we've got at least five controlled trials underway um, of the ketogenic diet for bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. Um, there's another trial getting started. There's one trial getting wrapped up actually in the UK of ketogenic diet for depression. Another one about to start under the um, uh, um, kind of guidance and authority of uh, Jeff Volek. Um, uh, but, but it's not limited to just people in low carb keto communities. So there's an overwhelming amount of evidence about metabolic mitochondrial disturbances and people with mental illness. And those researchers have been doing this research for decades. And as soon as I point out, this is a metabolic treatment. I don't talk about it as a diet. I talk about it as a metabolic intervention or a metabolic therapy that improves metabolism. Uh, that gets them excited about it. And then we've got, um, you know, we've got the whole field of neurology and epilepsy. And a lot of those researchers are very interested and passionate about seeing this because there's so much overlap between epilepsy and mental health. Um, and everybody knows it. And anybody who works in either field knows there's a tremendous amount of overlap between the um, those fields, not just in terms of the treatments that we use, but also in terms of comorbidity and the symptoms that we see. And, you know, to much people's surprise, probably the, um, you know, the, the National Institutes of Health has already done one study of the ketogenic diet for alcohol use disorder. That's the, the new label for alcoholism. Um, and we have one positive trial that this the ketogenic diet can be a powerful and effective treatment for people with alcohol use disorder. It can decrease um, uh, withdrawal symptoms. It can decrease cravings for alcohol. It can improve brain metabolism and decrease brain inflammation, all things that are really helpful and powerful in helping people recover from alcoholism. And they are now uh, launching a multi-million dollar trial. Um, so people in the mental health field are desperate for better answers than what we are giving patients today. You know, mental disorders are the leading cause of disability on the planet because our treatments just don't work for so many people. And so I think that a lot of mental health professionals, neuroscientists and others are really excited about this. Well, we're, we're great to see that there's an, an influx of uh, philanthrop philanthropy and, and money to, to fund this uh, research. And, um, you know, there's so many mechanisms that uh, we, we can talk about, but uh, I do agree, you know, that the, the pandemic, I mean, especially as a primary care doctor, we've just seen how devastating it's, it's been both emotionally uh, financially and 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 on the health side of things, and so we we all need to pull up on our bootstraps and and get things back in order and get our patients going in the uh, the right direction. And so, you know, I kind of joke with with the mental health professionals that uh, in recent years uh, business is booming. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, <laughs> this is great that we have another you know alternative treatments to. Um, to medication. And, um, you know, my, my wife is in a book group and um, there is a, a book, 
I don't know if you're familiar, it's called Hidden Valley Road and it's from a family in Colorado Springs. It was back in the 60s and 70s and they had 12 children. Six of them had schizophrenia, if you're familiar with the story. And that was some of the ammunition that uh, led to the conclusions that mental illness is a genetic disorder. And I know you have a lot to disagree on that with. I do. It's um, So there's no doubt that mental illnesses run in families. Um, that has been known for centuries, actually. Um, interestingly, mental illness runs in the same families that type 2 diabetes runs in. Um, and we know that type 2 diabetes runs in families. We know that obesity runs in families. And we know that cardiovascular disease runs in families. And yet, most people today, just human beings, but also researchers and clinicians, understand the primary cause of obesity is not in our genes. The primary cause of type 2 diabetes is not in our genes. And the primary cause of cardiovascular disease is not either. Now, yes, there are some rare genetic disorders that confer high levels of risk for all of those things. And likewise, there can be some rare genetic disorders that confer high levels of risk for mental disorders. But by and large, even though those disorders run in families, they are largely considered to be determined primarily by environment. And, you know, researchers have been struggling this for over two decades now, because when we mapped the human genome, the medical community was filled with hope. We were going to find the gene for type 2 diabetes. And we were going to find the gene for obesity. And we were going to find the gene for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder and major depression. And once we identified the genes, we would be able to figure out what those genes were doing. And then we would be able to solve all of these illnesses. And it just it, it's just not so. We've got had 20 years to do this work. Trust me, they have put AI on this task. AI says there's nothing there, folks. There's nothing to see here. AI has analyzed the human genome up and down. The, the primary answer does not lie in genetics. That doesn't take away from the fact that these disorders run in families. And so we have to somehow reconcile that fact. Obesity does run in families, and it's not just upbringing. Everybody thinks it's upbringing, but if an obese woman has an infant and gives that infant up for adoption to a lean, fit family, that child still has a dramatically elevated risk of developing obesity just because of the fact that that infant's biological mother was obese and in particular was obese at the time that she had that child. And so there's something being transmitted. And again, up until recently, everybody assumed it was genes, but it's not. It's epigenetic signaling factors. And it's the womb environment and all sorts of other things that do change the, um, the expression of genes. That do, and that does confer risk over long periods of time. But the good news is that, you know, genetics can't be changed. And people are working on it and they're working on gene therapies that will change your defective genes into non-defective ones or at least replace, you know, those. But the good news is that we, we don't need gene therapy to cure or heal schizophrenia or bipolar disorder because it's not in the genes. It's in epigenetics. And epigenetics can be changed through environment like diet and exercise and lots of other things. Yeah, so epigenetics, the expression of the gene, but uh, this is really the, the argument of nature versus nurture. 
And so, you know, I think you and I and other healthcare professionals are, are realizing that the, the shift really comes to the nurturing part, you know, and the environment in, in which we live. And we can't really be blaming uh, genetics and they can't be changed much anyway. And look, when, it, when we see two thirds of the population have an insulin resistance problem or a problem with weight in the last four or five decades, you can't really blame genetics for that at all. So you, you can't. And although and so you, you brought up insulin resistance and so if, and I, if I can insert one really cool, interesting study that t starts to tie some of this together. Um, some, some researchers actually followed 5,000 children from the ages of 1 to 24. The kids who had the highest levels of insulin resistance beginning at age 9 were three times more likely to already be diagnosed with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia by the time they turned 24. And they were five times more likely to be at risk for developing schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, meaning that although, you know, although some of them were not officially diagnosed, they were showing worrisome signs and symptoms. So a five-fold increase, that's 500% increase, that is huge. Right now, we don't have any biomarkers other than something like that that can predict whether somebody is going to go on to develop bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So although most people you know, might hear me say, saying stuff and thinking, well, schizophrenia, that has nothing to do with diet or that has nothing to do with insulin resistance, actually, it really does. So... Yeah. So just, you know, that's an association studies that you're reporting, but the thing is an, an association is really significant when it's over 2X and you're saying it's 5X. I didn't know this information, but oh my God, this, you know, we really need to be addressing the, uh, the insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome. And so we'll, we'll dive into why the diet works, but just to back up and review some of the mechanisms that, that you have uh, mentioned and the first thing is, you know, uh, food addiction, the reward centers of the brain and the idea that, uh, um, you know, we've now manufactured food to trigger the reward centers. And uh, this is really problematic, uh, number one. Also, I understand looking at uh, like seizures disorders that the problem is with um, excita excitation of the, uh, the, neuro, uh, the, the, the the neurochemicals and and you know where where we're looking at um, the connections of the neurons in the brain and so the idea is um, can we affect that in a positive way say through a ketogenic diet and and why why might that work and you know the other aspect is that. Um, Traditionally, we've thought of glucose as being the only fuel for the brain. Uh, fat, per se, uh, doesn't necessarily get um, metabolized by the brain, but then this discovery that um, keto, keto bodies, you know, beta-hydroxybutyrate, is can be the other fuel for the brain. And the idea in the research is that when you switch the fuel over to ketones, it's, it stabilizes everything. So look, you're the expert. And maybe you can add to that. <laughs> yeah. So um, there, you, you mentioned a lot. So there's a ton to unpack and even more to add. But <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, the in terms of its anti-seizure effect, there are, you know, the ketogenic diet is known to affect at least three different neurotransmitter systems. Those are GABA, glutamate, and adenosine. And, um, you know, a lot of people talk about seizures as an imbalance of GABA and uh, glutamate activity. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter and GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And the assumption is that, well, if a brain is seizing, then it must have too much of the excitatory stuff and or not enough of the inhibitory stuff. It really is that simple. I mean, th this imbalance of those neurotransmitters actually hasn't really been clearly shown and it would, it would change on a regular basis. But we do have evidence that ketone bodies themselves, actually a study just came out a couple of weeks ago, showing that administering exogenous beta-hydroxybutyrate um, to people not on a ketogenic diet 
influences brain uh, function and brain neurotransmitters and specifically glutamate and GABA activity in specific brain regions. So we know that that is probably playing a role. Um, the ketogenic diet also influences calcium channel um, and calcium signaling, which is a really important kind of on-off switch in brain cells. Um, and as I mentioned before, it decreases brain inflammation and everybody knows brain inflammation is bad. So decreasing it must be good. Um, and sure enough, ketogenic diet has been shown to do that. Uh, the, the study with uh, people um, with alcohol use disorder actually showed that it decreased brain inflammation in those patients. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of, there's a lot of competition in terms of what is the mechanism of action. So ketone bodies themselves are an alternate fuel source, as you mentioned. So instead of, if your cells have trouble using glucose, then give them ketones. Um, and maybe that will be an easier fuel source for them to use. And sure enough, that does seem to probably be true, um, at least in some cell types. But uh, there's one group of researchers that argued in a very prestigious uh, journal called Cell that, oh, wait, actually the primary mechanism of action of the ketogenic diet on seizures is through the gut microbiome. Um, and what they showed is that you know, it was, it, it was, they were all mouse studies, but they showed that the ketogenic diet, in fact, changes the gut microbiome, that they could take this gut microbiome from mice on ketogenic diets, transplant it into mice who were not following a ketogenic diet, and those mice that got the transplanted poop essentially had an anti-seizure effect just from changing the gut microbiome. Now, uh, you know, for people familiar with gut, mic gut microbiome research, it's all exciting and it's like the, the, the latest it thing. And, uh, but changing the gut microbiome probably won't have long lasting effects if you don't change your diet and change your other lifestyle factors. Like we can change your, we can transfer a gut microbiome to anyone and that might change your micro biome for like a week or two, but if you're still eating the same diet that you're eating before, it's going to revert right back to what it was before. I mean, there, it's not like changing the gut microbiome is going to be a magic bullet cure. Um, it might be helpful in some cases to kind of jumpstart the process, but uh, it, it's not going to be a magic bullet, I don't think. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've seen some studies about that as well. So it's, it's really good stuff. And so one of the questions I have is that, you know, th through, um, you know, the studies on seizure disorders and specifically they have some child, uh, some, some groups uh, that, that support the community, Matthew Friends and Charlie Foundation. And, you know, they have found for sure that ketogenic diets have helped individuals. And, you know, personally, I have clinical experience, you know, cases where uh, actually the, the neurology group sent patients to me in town because they, they knew that um, I put patients on ketogenic diets as one of our therapeutic choices. Although they tell the patients it's really hard and it's almost impossible to do. But what we see is that uh, seizures threshold um, increases. So, you know, the, the auras decrease, the number of seizures decrease, and we see that over and over again. And, you know, I think through these foundations, we've actually seen that it, it not in, addi in addition to helping seizures, it's, it's helped patients with the metabolic syndrome. And, and so um, I, I like how you say the problem is inflammation in the brain. You know, I would almost say that it's metabolic syndrome in the brain that uh, we're ex experienced. We're, we're, we're experiencing. And so, you know, the question is, can you, can you translate what, what, what they're doing with seizure disorders over to, you know, addressing metabolic disease? Yeah. Are you, are you mean mental disease or mental disorders or meta? I mean, certainly there's a, well, trim it, it's funny. It, it's kind of a blur. Like mental health is metabolic health. It is. So yeah. that, and that, that is absolutely the, the, theme of my book. It, it, there's no question about it. Um, the, I think that, you know, the, the diet that we're using, sometimes there are differences between an, an anti-seizure diet and a diet for weight loss or a diet for type 2 diabetes, even though they're all 
typically low in carbohydrates. Some of them will be more restrictive on protein or how much fat they're recommending or other, you know, kind of macro issues. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, one of the beautiful things about using metabolic treatments for all of these different disorders. So you're not just treating one disorder. It's not the whack-a-mole that modern medicine is right now. Modern medicine is whack-a-mole. It's, if you go to your endocrinologist for your diabetes, they're going to whack the mole that is your blood glucose. And they're going to give you medicines or insulin or something else to try to knock your, bring your insulin, um, you know, uh, or bring your glucose levels down. Usually your insulin goes up. Um, but then that might make your bipolar disorder worse, or that might make you gain more weight, or that might make you um, more depressed. Uh, and But they don't care about that because they're just whacking one mole. And, uh, and then you're going to your weight loss doctor or your primary care doc who says, you know, you've got to lose some weight. And, but since you're already on a medication for, you know, say you're taking insulin, well, that's going to really make it an uphill battle for you to lose weight while you're taking insulin. And now your bipolar disorder is getting worse. So now your, your psychiatrist is going to put you on your bipolar meds. Guess what? They make insulin resistance even worse and they make you gain even more weight. So now your diabetes doctor is saying, oh, now we got to go up on your insulin. And uh, now your you know, weight loss doctor is saying, what's going on here? You're, you're, you're losing ground. You're not making. When we use a metabolic approach, a comprehensive metabolic approach to all of these disorders, we can get all of those disorders better at the same time. And we can save the healthcare system a lot of money. But more importantly than saving money, we can prevent human suffering. We can restore health and happiness to lots of human beings who, you know, everybody says, oh, these are unsustainable. I don't know. What is health worth, worth to a human being? I deal with people who are desperate for better answers. And although a lot of people say, oh, the ketogenic diet is not sustainable, I'm getting patients with schizophrenia to sustain this diet and lose 160 pounds and keep it off. So I don't know what's wrong with all of you that you <laughs> or all these other people who can't seem to get normal, ordinary people to do a diet, but I can get very ill people to do this diet and stick with it. Because when you give people accurate, helpful, motivating information, they really do want to improve their lives. They want to feel better. They want to improve their health. And we need to empower them. We need to recognize that, yes, you're capable of doing this. Maybe it'll take some time. Maybe you'll fall off the wagon a few times. That's okay. We're not going to judge you. We're not going to get angry that you fell off the wagon. We're not going to say, oh, see, this is unsustainable. You, you had a cookie. Oh, clearly this is unsustainable. We're going to say, okay, you had a cookie. No big deal. Let's let's talk about getting back on the diet. Let's do it. Like, because you're going to be better off if we get you better. So I, I love it, Chris. We, we speak the same language. We get it. And our goal is to empower patients. And, you know, I have I have a funny um, way to express how um, healthcare is compartmentalized. Like you said, it's all whack-a-mole. And so my, my little thing that I get a chuckle out of is I say, you go to the endocrinologist, he's worried about diabetes. So he tells you to stop eating sugar and carbohydrate. You go to the cardiologist, he's worried about your heart. He tells you to stop eating fat. You go to the nephrologist, the kidney doctor, he's worried about kidneys. So he tells you to cut out your protein and you put that all together and you just don't eat forever and you're going to be healthy. But I, I think I have to add a fourth thing to it. And then this patient who's told not to eat anything goes to the psychiatrist and he says, you know, just take all these medications and, you know, we're going to make all the other problems worse. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it is, it is frustrating the way that healthcare uh, is so compartmentalized, but, uh, you know, it's our job to uh, educate healthcare professionals. And, you know, you and I both, I've been at it for, um, 
you know, over 30 years. And, uh, you know, I'm happy. I enjoy coming to work and seeing patients every day and, and, you know, educating my patients, educating healthcare professionals, educating, uh, and to, uh, teach everyone how, um, nutrition can be a, a powerful tool. Yeah, no, it's awesome. So, you know, we have just a couple minutes left and you kind of had a segue into your, your book and uh, we'd love to, to hear just a, a little teaser about the, your book, Brain en Energy, that's supposed to come out in the fall. Yes. So it's coming out in um, November, but if people see this before then, it's available for pure order even now. Brain Energy is really a synopsis of all of the research I've been doing over the last six years. I, I started out writing a book on the ketogenic diet in psychiatry and quickly realized nobody's going to believe this. It's just not going to go anywhere. I, I, need, I need to go deeper. I need to do deeper dive into the science. And to my shock and amazement, uh, when I did the deeper dive in the science, um, I ended up connecting the dots of mental illness. And so, so my book is kind of a tour through what I call the metabolic and mitochondrial theory of mental illness. And I am arguing that all mental disorders are metabolic disorders of the brain and that, uh, and that we can use effective metabolic interventions like diet, exercise, sleep, and other things to improve metabolic brain function and thereby reverse mental disorders, mental disorders that right now a lot of people think are permanent lifelong disorders. Um, and, uh, you know, for better or worse, the book is a science book. Um, I, I go into a broad range of science from clinical, epidemiological, but all the way down to the cell the level of the cell to try to help people understand what exactly is happening in the brain uh, at a metabolic level that would cause mental symptoms. But more importantly, what can we do to try to help? What can we do to try to reverse this? And, um, but I, it is written for a lay audience. It, it, I use tons of analogies. I try to make it as simple as possible. But it does include science because I want to upend the entire mental health field. And I knew that in order to do that, I would have to come fully prepared with lots of evidence published in leading journals. And in some ways, although I do think this is revolutionary and has the ability to transform the mental health field, it is, it's not a speculative theory. You know, a lot of times people use the word theory as, in place of speculation. Like, I have a theory about what you're thinking. Well, no, you really have a speculation about what you're thinking. This theory is basically integrating decades of existing clinical and neuroscience. Um, and it's taking all of the evidence that we have and it's connecting the dots of mental illness. Uh, that That's great, Chris. I, you know, I would say that the book is full of... Um, um, you know, uh, mechanisms, hy hypotheses, you know, case studies. And uh, you definitely have to bring that book along with you in uh, February because I know lots of our audience will want to get a hold of it. And uh, I guess the book would be a sedge way to more research. Thank you. Yes, it will. Great, <clears throat> Chris. Well, you know, one last question for you is, um, I, I like to, to ask our, our speakers is, what do you enjoy about uh going to uh, these conferences, the summits, events, and, and speaking in person? You know, there are lots of things that I enjoy about it. Probably the number one thing, though, is just meeting all the people. Um, and uh, it is always kind of invigorating um, to because I, I get to hear people's success stories but I also get to talk to people who maybe go to the conference for the very first time and they're just looking for information about how can I improve my weight or how can I improve my diabetes or hopefully how can I improve my mental health using some of these metabolic strategies. And, um, and it's an opportunity to 
kind of share knowledge and uh, share encouragement and excitement and hopefully get them connected with the rest of the whole the audience. Um, and, uh, you know, so that it's a community of people supporting each other. Oh, that's, that's great, Chris. Well, I know we uh, first met at the Metabolic Health Summit a few months ago. And just to tell our audience, this, this guy is bouncing off the walls. He has so much <laughs> energy. He probably strapped him down to the tra- strapped himself to the seat here today for the, for this uh, the podcast. But um, you know, we wish you the best and that you can really change the world of psychiatry. Thank you, thank you so much. So, how can our audience find out more about you, Chris? Um, best place is to either go to my website, chrispalmermd.com. Uh, or uh, if you're on social media, I'm probably most active on Twitter. So you can follow me at Chris Palmer MD. And uh, those would be two really good ways. So hopefully within a month, we're going to have a new website up, brainenergy.com. That's going to have a lot more information on the metabolic theory of mental illness. But for now, chrispalmermd.com. Great, Chris. Well, we look forward to having you at the conference again in February. And uh, for anybody that's interested in the conference, please visit lowcarbconferences.com. So that's all for now. And uh, until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Jeff.